Good morning, everyone. Happy Wednesday. Woohoo! Welcome to Live Coffee Talk Show. I'm Michelle Quay. I'm a confidence and leadership coach. I am delighted today because I have Carl Welsh, who is a professional public speaker, trainer, communication coach, and a member of the National Speaker Association here with me today. He is one of the very few Americans to have graduated from the Royal Academy, Academy of Dramatic Art in London. And he spent 20 years on stage as actor, director, then found that he likes business as a greater challenge. So he spent 29 years in corporate America with such companies as Warehouse Music, CNR Clothier, the Walt Disney Company, and Smart and Finals. And Carl was um, one of the 10 finalists from the Toastmasters World Champion of Public Speaking in 2009 and was featured on Toastmasters Magazine for his use of theater games to express his point. He now acts as consultant and speaker business sp speaker on business management to professionals and MBA schools, especially on the topic of drawing the problem solving creativity lockup within the workforce. So join me with a warm welcome, Carl Welsh. Good morning, Carl. Well, good morning, Michelle. Glad, to, to, glad your... to see you so bright and early here. <laughs> I know, right? And welcome to your, this is your first uh, Facebook live show. That is correct. So, so tell me, tell me about your, because the topic today, we're talking about stage live evolution. So how did it go? What, what's the stage live revolution um, being like for you? Well, first of all, even though I was an actor for many years, notice I stayed in the theater and that's because I hate the camera. I hate the camera lens. Could, could never get over that. I, I did some work on television in, in England and, and a little bit of film here, and I hated it. So I stayed with theater. But that's all changed now, right? Mm -hmm. It's uh, the camera is everything. So I have I'm 65 years old and I'm finally getting to be friendly with that lens, that black eye that keeps watching you. What, what is it about I'm, the I'm lens? I'm finally getting used to it. What is it about the lens that you didn't like? I have no idea. Uh, maybe it was the cold unresponsiveness of it. Mm -hmm. I was so used to uh, the energy of, a, of an audience in, in a theater. And it's one of the things that drives me as a speaker as well. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure that change, um, a, a, like really drastic change right now because speaker, you know, we're used to standing in front of the audience and there's that, you want that audience engagement. There's that energy that comes from the audience and it's, a, it's about performing. And, and you were a performer. Right, exactly. And I've been doing for the last eight years, two hour presentations, two a day, five, uh, five days a, a week. Mm -hmm. And every presentation was different, even though it was the same topic, be, due to who was in that audience. The, 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 the audience always drove me quite, quite a lot. Mm. Yeah. So, so tell us about your stage life. What was that like? Sure. How, how did you get into the, the uh, whole staging? Well, first of all, I, when I was young, I had a very serious speech impediment. I could barely get a sentence out without stuttering and stammering. And that's pretty rough growing up with. Uh, speech impediment is still the one impairment that people are allowed to ridicule you for. And kids will do it. So, of course, I had to become an actor, right? I was a, <laughs> I was a short cross-eyed kid with a, with a stammer. <laughs> Perfect, right? But that's what I wanted to do. And, and you know, I'll, I'll just tell you, I was seven years old when I walked into a theater and saw Lawrence of Arabia, and I, I just wanted to be Peter O'Toole. That, that was that. So I worked at it and worked at it, and it was about halfway through high school that 
if I memorized the script and said it, it's a little bit like what they did in the King's Speech, mm -hmm. the film. If I memorize the script, I wouldn't stammer. I, I, I've never stammered on stage with a memorized script. And because of that, I began conquering it and began training my mouth towards it because it really was something that's not very well understood. Still isn't really, it still isn't. But, it, but, but anyway, that's what got me into it. Mm -hmm. And one day walking through the halls of the UCLA theater department where I was a student, I saw a little notice for a summer program at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art. And I thought, well, that'll be neat. I'd like to do that. So I did the summer program there and I said, well, okay, this is it. I'm home. This is what I want to do. And for my first trip to New York following April, I went and auditioned. And out of a little over 2,000 people, they picked 21. And amazingly, they picked me. Wow. <laughs> and of course, they picked very few Americans. And so I was just, you know, lucky. I, I, I guess I did the right thing at the right time. And I got in there. Uh, and just as a side note, my very first day in the academy, I was just cr cruising through the rooms there. And th they have a couple of different awards there. And they, they list the winners. And I went through it. And guess who I saw up there? Who? Peter O'Toole. Oh. I didn't even know he'd gone to the Royal Academy. And that's when I went, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, good decision. I'm here. <laughs> wow. And, and that was it. I came back to, to L.A. after that, after what the program ran two and a half years and I graduated and came back here and with a group of other actors started a theater company in West LA and um, that's that's how we got going yeah I, I remember there's first time a couple of years ago one of my friend who is in the theater and she, he invited me to to mm -hmm. go watch a an actual um, off-broadway shows and so we watched um, in the heights um, so it mm -hmm. was one of the off-Broadway shows and he introduced me to like all these settings and the actor where they're going to be standing and and he invited me to look down to the stage it would never occur to me as an audience to to go up to the stage and just look down where the where the instruments are playing where the where the band is being, being right done. yeah the orchestra pit yeah yeah so what what was it like to be part of that you know, just being on the stage and watching the audience and there you go, music is turning, music is on, lights is on. Well, acting is a little bit different from, from speaking. And in fact, that mm -hmm. was a transition that I, that I had to make. In most acting, most of it, you have a fourth wall. So you ignore the, the audience. They're welcome to eavesdrop. But it, it, except the rare case where you have, you actually address the audience, you ignore them. Well, you can't do that as, as a speaker, right? So, because, and, and, and that's the way I made the transition is that to be a speaker, the audience is the other player in the scene. So they are the other character. And, and it, it took me a couple of years to make that shift. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, to be, on a stage and staring out uh, into the darkness of a, particularly if it's a large theater, um, it's exhilarating. It really is. It's it's quite it's quite exhilarating. Um, and when you get the response, when you're doing something that the audience is really reacting to and relating to, well, there's nothing like it. There there really is nothing like it. Mm -hmm. I love how you use the word exhilarating because a lot of oh. people will use the word nervous or, <laughs> or anxiety or fear, oh, no. right? <laughs> no, no, no. A, a director told me early on, uh, never worry about being nervous. It's how we show the audience we care. It's all right. And that nervous energy is actually very useful. I went through about a year 
where I lost all that nervous energy. I became so at home on stage that, I mean, I, I could have walked out there and taken a shower and, you know, I, I wouldn't pay attention to you guys. Uh, worst acting I've ever done in my life during that, that, that year. It's, mm -hmm. it, it, it was terrible because I had no, no life. People want to see a heightened reality in the theater. And even when you're speaking to a certain extent, again, it's different when you're, when you're speaking because you're speaking directly to them, but they still want to see just a, a little heightened re reality there. Nerves gives you that. What is a heightened reality when you're on the stage? It's something, well, if, if you watch a play mm -hmm. the, and you really sit back and analyze, they are not speaking like real people speak. They're not saying things that real people say. It's all at a heightened level where the, the reality, the experience of reality is taken to a higher level. And um, that's, that's your heightened re re reality. When you w go to a movie theater and you're seeing spaceships and robots and, and everything, that's a heightened reality. But if it's good, it's still reaching you. It's getting to your gut. It's getting to your brain, all of it. And, and you're relating to it. You know, a good Star Wars film, like say Rogue One, which is my favorite, that is, it's really getting to all the centers it's supposed to get to, and it becomes very, very moving and, and very uh, affecting. Even something like, like that, a space opera, like Rogue One, it can work. Mm -hmm. what, what's your, so, so, you know, cause I asked that question because I feel a lot of, um, especially the newer, newer speaker, we're nervous, we're, we're mm -hmm. anxious to get out there and to uh, be able to speak. And, and so a lot mm -hmm. of time we, we have scripts and, you know, like they, they, tell, they, they tell you, um, come up with a speech, memorize it, remember it, let it go, but you're still speaking with a script. So, so mm -hmm. how do you tie the heightened reality to the script that's in our head? Well, early on, I used to memorize my script word for word. And I'd rehearse it, rehearse it, rehearse it. In other words, I was doing theater. Guess what? That's not that good. That really doesn't, doesn't work. Uh, you, you really do need to for, forget it. Once you've got it down, it's, it's almost like you're remembering bullet points. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the important thing. And, and when I'm doing a, a two hour presentation, how, come on, I'm not going to memorize it word for word. And I'm not going to relate to my audience because I'm not going with them. I'm not taking them into their, their experience. So every presentation has to be different. Mm -hmm. One of the world champions, oh, going back to 1990, David Brooks, he said that there's three stages of being a speaker. Stage one, you're worried about how you sound and how you look. And that's when you're really self-conscious. Mm -hmm. Stage two, you're really focused on the content. And that's good. A, a, a lot of good speakers, that's, that's the level that they, that they reach. And that's fine. But then there's stage three. And that's where you're focused on the audience. Because you know your content so well. You don't have to think about it. And you left worrying about yourself a long time ago. So now you're focused on your audience and you can begin playing with the audience and having fun with, with them. And, and that just heightens the bond between the two of you. Mm -hmm. so, so I'm curious because initially um, we talked about how you were uh, practice speaking when you were back in uh, high school, right? So you were using mm -hmm. a script. And at what point did you actually let go of your script? No. Well, on the, in, in theater, you can't you must go word, word for word because other actors are depending on hearing the right words to do what they have to do, okay? So uh, on theater, you don't. But once I started speaking, I realized after a while 
that mistakes can be the best part of your presentation. What you can consider a, mis a mistake, the audience has, has fun with, as long as you have fun with it. Mm -hmm. And again, it's creating that bond with, with your audience, particularly if, you're, if the content is educational or instructional, mm -hmm. man, that can, that can just drive the audience into a coma. And, and you know, it's, it's not their fault. It's not your fault. It's, it's, it's just, if, if you're up there preaching to them, come on, would you, would you listen to a two hour sermon? Nope. No. <laughs> not if you pay me a million dollars. Right. So you gotta, you gotta loose, loosen up. You gotta have the confidence in yourself that you know your content and that you're okay and then just focus on, on them. That's, that's, and that was an evolution that happened over a period of years, yeah. really, just getting in front of audiences, doing it over and over and over again, and finding out that even the worst mistake that I could make, I would still be living at the end of the presentation. Yeah, what, 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 if you were to recall the biggest mistakes that you made. Honestly. Oh my gosh. <laughs> what was it? Oh my gosh. Uh, well, in theater, the biggest mistake I made, and I was, this is embarrassing. I mean, real, <laughs> real amateur stuff here. I was doing uh, Othello in, uh, in Los Angeles. And I, I, I wasn't playing Othello. I was playing I Iago, who is the villain uh, of the uh, thing. And there's this scene that happens in a, in a tavern. And we're passing this wine bottle in a, that's covered in a wicker uh, covering. We're passing that ar ar around. And the bottom came loose. And the wine bottle fell to the floor. It was obviously empty. There was <laughs> nothing in it. Now, if that happened to me today, I would probably pick it up and you know show my disappointment that it was empty, but not me. No, no, I went and took that swig that I was supposed to take at that point with everybody knowing the bottle is empty for, for God's sake. So that's an example of not being in the reality of the moment, not willing to uh, break with rehearsal. And so that, that was very early on, on as, a, a, as a speaker, the worst one I made, I was in Seattle and I forgot to plug my laptop in. And about two thirds of the way through my presentation, it died. Ooh. The laptop just died. And that's, that had all my visuals, everything on it. And so uh, that was actually an important moment for me because I had to go without it for, for, for a while and get it plugged in and operating again and still relate to my audience. Mm. Horrible mistake, but it was a big moment for me because it loosened me up a lot. I realized, oh, I can do that. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. You can't hurt me anymore now. <laughs> So, sounds like it was your worst nightmare, but yet, you know, that worst nightmare actually would have a great uh, opportunity of learning to become exactly. where you are now. And oddly enough, it's probably through mistakes that you gain the most confidence when you realize it's okay. <laughs> yeah. I remember when I first started this show, which is, we were just talking about this about like almost a year ago, and I made a lot of mistakes. So, so initially, I was following your script, uh, number one, because I was nervous. I, I was afraid of the camera <laughs> initially. <laughs> Turn it on. What do I say? And yeah. how do I even start? And what do I need to talk about? And so it was a lot of struggle initially. And, and I realized that, you know, just get rid of the script. You know what? You don't need the script. And you just go with the flow. It's so much easier, and more, more relaxed, more enjoyable. And the conversation just seems to be a lot better than if I were to follow a script. And you see a lot of that on film, where a lot of times movies are very loosely scripted. Mm -hmm. 
and the actors are allowed to just just play, to play pretend. Great way to make a living, uh, and 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 to just go with what's happening. And some of the best films. I mean, Robert Altman barely ever wrote a script, and because of it, some of his films fail miserably, but some of them are really brilliant too. And it's, it's, it's because the actors are really working it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that's a, that's a great thing. <laughs> yeah. So, so in, in your, in your opinion, what, mm -hmm. which aspects of being an actor and being on the stage had really helped you becoming a speaker today? Not, well, not being afraid of the audience. Although there was a little trepidation when I first started speaking, I, it, it, it was a big transition. I, you know, I, I, I started doing it sort of as a lark. The company I was working at, one of the departments thought their, their people could use the Toastmasters training. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, let's see if I can do that. You know, that's, and, and I actually hadn't been on stage for quite some time. I thought, well, let's, let's see. Here's the big difference. Uh, as, as, as far as the nerves go. If uh, Shakespeare, Tennessee Williams, Eugene O'Neill, Neil Simon, if those people are writing my script, I'm pretty confident. If I'm writing the script, oh, that was a whole big change. I wasn't so confident then. And that was just doing it over and over and recognizing, yeah, I can do that. Uh, I can... I can put my thoughts into a coherent format and get it across to people. And once I was convinced that I could do that, then I was away. Mm. It was good. Yeah. I, I always think about ourselves as uh, the, the perfect script writer. We've been writing mm -hmm. script all our life. We've just been writing it very in a very negative and condescending way instead of being... No motivational and inspirational right. that, that keep us going. <laughs> right. And, and, and it kind of changes your self image as well. Don't we, don't most people go around criticizing themselves all the time, all the time. You, you have a good idea and your first re response is, ah, no, 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 that'll never work. Why would you do that? There's enough people out there to do it for you. You don't need to do that. Yeah. <laughs> and, and as a speaker, it's even worse, right? Because now you're facing, what, 150, 2,000 people in the audience, and, and there mm -hmm. you are. You're writing this uh, automatic script play. It's just rolling in the bag, and it's filming you. You are on the spotlight right, right there. Mm -hmm. Right. So I'm curious, you know, so what is – this is probably going to tap into your secret of be becoming the, the – successful professional speaker mm -hmm. um what is your one top strategy of engaging your audience if possible where and and it often is possible i like to sp speak to a few audience members beforehand mm -hmm. so that they are real real people and i get to know them and if i possibly can refer to them during my present presentation. If, if, if there's something there and I, I ask them questions that will, re, that will relate, hopefully they'll give me information that I can give back to the audience. And the funny thing is, if you talk to one person in the audience, and I mean really talk to them, the audience feels like you're talking to all of them. It's a weird, weird thing. It, it doesn't sound like that should work, but it does. It <laughs> actually does. I, I've recently tried that at one of my speaking engagements. So I, I, have, a, I have a tendency to go to these events or early so I can talk to people. And, and like, I, I like people watching. So a mm -hmm. lot of time, you know, when people are talking, they're speaking, I watch them and I engage them by having a conversation. And during my speech, I do exactly what you said, <laughs> pointing yeah. it out, isolate them. 
Yeah, and and then the audience feels like you're their friend, really, and they're they're having to they're having a conversation over coffee. That's and and we are we are friend. <laughs> there we go. Uh, cheers. <laughs> <laughs> So, Carl, tell us where you are now today in terms of speaking, career-wise. Where are you now? Well, interesting, COVID came along at the same, at, at, at the right time for me. Uh, I mean, I hate to say it that way, but, <laughs> but, it, but it, it did. Last November, I left what I was doing uh, with realtors. It, it had just become too much. Uh, you know, dragging all my equipment and everything through airports, living in hotels one week out, out of every month. Uh, there were times where I barely knew where my, where my home was. And so I, I had had about enough of that. And I just decided to transition into what I've always wanted to do, and which I have been doing to a lesser ex extent, because the, the realtor thing took took up all my, uh, well, a large part of my time. Mm -hmm. I've been working on bringing out creativity in the workplace. And I've been taking that into MBA schools. I've been taking it into some pro professional organizations and some companies. And it's been working out really, really well. People have gotten quite a lot out of it. So I, I finally decided, okay, if I keep doing this traveling all over the country thing, which is fun and all, but I, I'm never going to get to what I really want to want to do. Mm -hmm. And so last no November, I made the break. And then all of a sudden COVID hits, which has given me a fair amount of time to begin really putting it together, getting my thoughts to, to, together and learning how to use this medium that we're using here to reach a large audience to, to get to many more people now. And that's, so it's been a great training period for me. You know, let's just put it that, that way. Uh, it's been a great training yeah. for me, which I needed. Yeah. It so, sounds like you're using this pandemic as an opportunity to advance yourself in your personal enrichment and development. And, and it seems like a perfect timing, like it's a perfect storm. Well, and that's, that sounds sort of selfish and almost abusive, but yes, that, that's, that's what I've been doing. Um, what, what else you gonna do? I mean, what else you gonna do? Um, my uh, wife is in a high vulnerability uh, a group for the disease. So we've been in this house since right around the first week of February because we, we saw it coming. I always watched the BBC and they were doing very good coverage on what was going on in Wuhan. And when they shut Wuhan down on January 23rd, we looked at each other and went, oh boy, it's coming. And we, we, we immediately be, began making plans for it. Mm -hmm. So as I say, I've, we've been quarantined here since early February. What am I going to do? And so, yes, I, I, I began training and writing and getting my, my, myself in shape and finally putting together the book I've been trying to put together for years and didn't have the time for. And now I've had the time. So that's, that's coming along very nicely as well. Mm -hmm. and, and I just wanted to say that there's nothing selfish about taking care of yourself. Right. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it's all about taking care of ourselves first before we move out there and taking care of other people. So if we we, we kind of have to, you know, this is what they teach you when you're on the airplane. When the airplane crashes, you put on your mask first before you take care of someone else. So it's really important people get that idea right. You know, there's nothing selfish about taking care of yourself. Um, what's your book about? Exactly. Um, well, I'm I've I've got sort of two books in, in, in mind. And, and, and I'm, as I, as I put the outlines to, to together, I realize 
maybe they really are one and one illustrates the other. And what those two are, are putting my two careers together, basically, uh, in theater mm -hmm. and my years in the corporate world. S and I started out as a part-time holiday sales clerk in a record store and was promoted to assistant manager a couple months later. And I found out, wow, I like this. I, I like retail and I like dealing with the public because mm -hmm. I was always shy b b before then. Um, and, and most actors are just painfully shy. I, I know that sounds strange, but most of them are. Again, because they are hiding behind scripts mm -hmm. most of the time or yeah. behind the fake nose, <laughs> I like to call it. <laughs> um, so all of the lessons that I learned in theater, much to my amazement, translated very nicely into business. I s spent a lot of time as a director. And let me tell you, getting a bunch of actors and their egos and their fears and getting them to line up to bring your vision to life is hard. It's really hard. But it's it translates into business on how you get people to line up and get your vision going there. If you're just managing people, in other words, you've, you know, you've got the clipboard and the checklist and you're doing that. Okay, well, you're a manager and, and we need man managers. That's, that's great. Down on the factory floor, you need that manager. But if you want to be a leader now, you've got to get the, the vision thing going and get people to do it. And I learned a lot in theater on how to do that. That worked very well for me in, in, in business. And it's why I was eventually able to rise in, in the corporate world. Mm -hmm. Even I, I in areas think... I had no uh, technical training in. <laughs> Seriously, yeah. I think one of the things that always come up for me as people talking about how there's so much similarity between the business world versus our, our personal life or any aspects of life, right? Um, mm -hmm. There's only one common constant in, in all case scenario, no matter what setting that you are in, and that person is you. You yeah. are in the business world. You are in your uh, private personal life. You are in everywhere. And so it's really the idea of having that self-leadership um, leading and seeing ourselves as the leader in our life and and quite honestly you know I'm leading my cat my cat Buster is leading by me all the time I dictate I tell Buster what to do right so in a way it's really about our self-leadership any anywhere yes. everywhere <laughs> yes Buster I have a vision of you not being on the sofa right <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I have a and I need you to work with work with me rather than work yeah. against me. So how can exactly. we do this together? Exactly. <laughs> so before I let you go though, because now we're transition we're transitioning from the stage live into this virtual world. What would be mm -hmm. your one advice for people who is looking into speaking more and looking into um, be comfortable having this type of performance? I, I called ourselves yes. agi well, agitator. Right. Well, first of all, practice, practice, practice. Every, and every chance you get to be in front of people, you take it. You, you, you just get yourself up there. And in the beginning, that means you'll, you'll do some free stuff. That, and, and that's fine. That's fine. Get the experience so that you can start building confidence. Then you can start branching out and all of a sudden start making a living at, at it. It, it. It took me a few years to where I was making decent money doing this. Mm -hmm. uh, but okay, you work at it. Most actors work for years. For, it, actually, almost any actor who isn't already a A-list would gladly get on a stage for free. That's why we have age. That's why we have agents, <laughs> because the the agent stops that from happening. 
<laughs> but you, you know, you'll, you just want to get up there and do it. And you, you need to do the same thing as a, as a speaker, as far as online goes, put aside $300 for four, $400 max, get decent equipment, per, particularly sound equipment. Sound is the most important thing. They'll forgive visuals, but sound is unforgivable. So get a decent microphone. I'm using a ring light right now that's right up there. It was $29, stand and light, okay? This is not expensive. So in, invest in those things um, to help you feel good and look good and get a good microphone so you'll sound good. And then just do it, do it, do it. Nike, all the way. Yeah, <laughs> and and good that they have uh, tennis shoes. They have running shoes because you just right. do it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> exactly. Be before I let you go, though, I I wanted to hear more about what that creativity at work um, looks like for people. Oh, yeah. Well, that's what happens when people are managed. Mm -hmm. uh, the creativity is locked up, and the thing is they know what's happening on the sales floor or the factory floor or, or whatever it is that they're doing better than you do. Accept it. They know more than you do. And there is so much problem solving, creative knowledge stored and locked up there. It's getting people together and brainstorming. It's creating an environment where it's okay to make a suggestion. It's even if the suggestion is, turns out to not be a, be a good one. And I'll tell you where I learned this most of all was the greatest company I ever worked for, which is the Walt Disney Company. The area that I worked in was fantastic. And what management did from the CEO down is when there was an important decision to make, they went to everybody and it was discussed and it was brainstormed and everybody had a sense of ownership to the problem. Everybody wanted to solve it. Mm -hmm. And so when the decision was finally made, even if it wasn't the way you were thinking, even if it wasn't the suggestion that you made, when they said student body left, everybody went left and that was very powerful very and it was because they felt they had had creative input on the whole thing mm -hmm. yeah it, it's about that employee employee engagement do i right. do i feel acknowledged do i feel validated do i feel being seen and that's face it you mm -hmm. know we all are living in a life of on the stage this very moment and we want to be seen and i want to be seen by my management so mm -hmm. if your management if you're in that position and you can provide that to your employee it's so much powerful than just coming off from that absolutely place of intimidation that plays of you know something that's forced who to blame and and whatnot so right and uh, hey it happens in theater too that's what a good rehearsal is uh, about discovering all kinds of, in, of of interesting things that nobody thought of but they happen in re rehearsal and being able to recognize ah keep it that's it that's great and the actor is now participating in the creative process and they're they're not just a robot going around saying the script and moving to that chair that the director told them to at the time that they told them to all right what what do you think the world needs carl well there's a song about that but right now right now i think um, there's so much strife and you can expect that at a time of pan pandemic. I mean, you, you go back to, to, to pandemics, it disrupts the, the social order and people need to sit down, maybe stop talking so much, maybe stop going on. Well, go on face, fa Facebook, but, um, tone it down. Uh, and I think the internet has contributed quite a lot 
to all the angst going on. You know, it's, it's a double-edged edged sword. It's this wonderful tool where we can all learn so, so much. And we can also be so destructive. And there's lots of people out there whose intent is to be dis destructive. And you need to be able to recognize that. Yeah. And, and don't, yes. don't completely cut out Facebook because I'm on Facebook and you are on Facebook soon. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's an incredible tool if used yeah. correctly. Yeah. Be, be uh, conscious. Make conscious choice about who you're going right. to follow. Yeah. yeah. I, I wrote or I, I, I wish I had written, uh, I, I read something that said, if, if your reply satisfies a huge emotional need and you really love it, stop. Think about it. Is that really what you want to say? That's all that stuff that's so emotionally satisfying. And, and I've done it my, my, myself. And afterwards, I go, oh, man, I, I wish I hadn't written that. And you got to pull it back and, and not satisfy your anger so much. Thank you so much, Crow. I This has been a great conversation. And you, I, I can talk to you forever, forever. <laughs> and but I wanted to uh, thank you for, for coming to the show. And my internet is not working really well right now. So um, thank you so much. And where can people find you? Where, where can people find you, Carl? Okay, sorry, you, you, I, I, I lost you there for, for a second. Um, where can people find me? Right, right now you can find me at Carl, C-A-R-L, at carlwalshspeaks.com. And you can also find me on Facebook. Now, there's a couple of Carl Walsh's out there. One of them is apparently a very unpleasant person. That is not me. So put in Carl Walsh speaker, and he'll get to me. <laughs> Carl, Carl is very nice. I, I can testify <laughs> to that. <laughs> and he has a great sense of humor. So you definitely wanted to follow him, follow him on Facebook and, and reach out to him on email. If you're looking to bring that creativity at work, workplace for yourself, for your company, or just wanted to connect with Krauss. He has such a great insight that he can share. So definitely reach out to him and, and connect with him. Great. And, and don't be, be afraid to ask me some, some questions out there because that will, that will help me know what, what you want to know. Exactly. Yes. And you can always uh, leave a comment on, on this uh, live video, type mm -hmm. in the questions, and, and this way we can, we can reach out back to you. So I wanted to thank you so much, Carl, for coming up to the show. Thank you. It was a, it was a pleasure. Thank you for asking me. All right, everybody. Well, thank you again for watching this week's live Coffee Talk show. This is where I bring you love, courage, and connection. And hopefully you found some values from watching this show. And if you like this show, be sure to follow me on Facebook. And I will see everyone next week at the same time, 8 o'clock in the morning Pacific time. Bye, everyone. Bye, Carl.